Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and this week as I mentioned on Tuesday I'm continuing my discussion of um, the lectures in Copenhagen that were part of the conference I was honored to be involved with a couple weeks ago. So this one, uh, this episode involves a uh, cardiologist by the name of Dr. Peter Wilmshurst and he reported on his experience being a whistleblower he started by outlining the various ways in which it is difficult, very difficult, for somebody to come forward or to try to make right scientific fraud and misconduct. The drug companies, government, and medical institutions use a lot of methods for, and they're effective, for silencing whistleblowers. And um, by the way, um, as with the other reports that I've made, when I came back home, I read more about each of these episodes online and found a lot of other supporting documentation, both in our archives and online. So uh, this will be a mixture of what Dr. Wilmshurst had to say and also what I can add to it uh, also. So uh, the first strategy that's used is libel and slander, literally campaigns to discredit the reputation and integrity of anybody who reports wrongdoing and discourage other people from uh, treating the report seriously. Um, one of our speakers at uh, the conference last year was Cheryl Atkinson, who's an investigative reporter, and she wrote a book called The Smear, and it really outlines the techniques that are used in politics, much the same type of stuff goes, goes on here, uh, to, to slander and libel people, just to say terrible false things about them, and then no matter what you do, those stories follow you forever. You know, social media follows you forever and that kind of thing. So one example in the medical field that Dr. Wilmshurst didn't talk about was Young Hee Ko, who was a cancer researcher at Johns Hopkins University who discovered a treatment that worked for all types of cancer and had no side effects. Her treatment was tested in animals that consistently caused cancer to regress and reverse for all um, uh, types of cancer. The treatment also worked for one teenage boy with an aggressive and fatal form of liver cancer in Germany. It was completely cured within a few, few weeks. She uh, got a commitment from the Komen Foundation to conduct some research on humans, but politics at Johns Hopkins intervened. She was informed from the administration via a letter that her continued employment was contingent on having a psychiatric evaluation for fitness. She refused to do this, and um, which was a smart thing to do because other people who have agreed to this have, of course, been declared mentally unstable and unable to work for that reason, and then that follows you. So she refused to do it. She sued Hopkins to get ownership of the patents on her discoveries and won, but she still, as of right now, does not have funding uh, to research the treatment that she developed. Another thing that drug companies and government and medical institutions do is disciplinary actions and dismissal. Anybody who threatens the status quo can be silenced by simply finding a reason to fire him or her or to withdraw funding, and this has been done on numerous occasions. So I'll give you some examples, um, and a couple of them Bob Whitaker talked about, the guy who wrote Anatomy of the Dep Epidemic at the conference. He was a presenter too, but uh, some examples. Lauren Mosher at one time was head of schizophrenia for the National Institutes of Mental Health. He developed something called the Soteria Project, and what this involved was schizophrenics living in a residential facility with lay people helping them, not experts and psychiatrists, just lay people, and uh, they were given little to no drugs. When he reported his results, which was that the patients at Soteria, under the care of lay people, were doing much better than patients cared for by expert psychiatrists at community mental health centers. Um, he was accused of bias and his peers demanded his resignation. He eventually lost all of his funding and the message to other people was very clear. There would be no future for people who didn't support the medical model of psychiatry. David Healy presented data showing that healthy people become suicidal as a result of taking psychiatric drugs. He was warned by the American Psychiatric Association to stop, and when he refused to do it, a job offer from the University of Toronto was rescinded. Nadine Lambert reported that kids who take Ritalin were more likely to become drug abusers, and her funding was cut off. And Gretchen Lefevre had the nerve to speak out about excessive diagnoses of ADHD in children. An anonymous person charged her with uh, scientific misconduct. Her computers were seized, and her funding was cut off. That's what happens to you when you tell the truth. Another thing is gagging contracts, which prohibit researchers from speaking publicly about their research or sharing data provided by the drug companies with anybody else. And you might remember last Tuesday's video clip, um, this was one of the issues with trying to get to the bottom of what statin drugs uh, do. Are they effective or harmful, etc., is gag orders that were um, issued by as part of the contract to provide information to researchers. 
There are other factors that discourage people from coming forward to report wrongdoing too. And one of them is the significant inequity in terms of resources. Drug companies have almost unlimited funds, while researchers are generally not rich people. The legal process is slow, which works against the middle class researcher and in favor of the drug companies or medical institutions with unlimited funds. The status quo is also maintained because libel laws often prevent the retraction of fraudulent articles or the retraction of degrees earned fraudulently, so the dishonest researchers continue to be employed and create more fraudulent work. And this goes on all the time. All of these factors combined make it very difficult for a person of high integrity to decide to do the right thing, which is to take a stand, report scientific fraud and misconduct, and to try to get accurate information out to the public. So we'll come back to Dr. Wilmshurst and his story, a cardiologist in the UK. He's been involved in a few of these cases, actually, and he ultimately prevailed in all of them. While some people might listen to this story and find it very inspiring, others, and this is the reason why uh, the drug companies make it happen this way, they hear the horrific stories and they say, gosh, I just don't think I can let that happen. I don't think I could survive that type of financial loss and that sort of thing. Some of what I talked about too. Um, I was pursued by a government agency that had gone after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and um, my case became very public but I think most people with the threat of jail time and everything else probably thought they didn't want to take on what I took on. All right, so here's how Dr. Wilmshar's story starts. He was a co-principal investigator for a trial funded by NMT, a company based in the United States, a drug manufacturer. The purpose of the trial, or device manufacturer, purpose of the trial was to determine if closing a hole in the hearts of patients with migraine using a device called the Starflex Septal Repair Implant would resolve their headaches. It didn't work. As a result, Wilmshurst refused to be listed as an author of the paper describing this whole thing that was published in circulation because the data in the article did not represent what actually the researchers found out in the trials. Um, he did agree to be interviewed about the issue with a journalist and he described all of the misbehavior and misreporting and all that sort of thing to the journalist. Um, now, some of the things that they talked about, this is just almost hard to imagine, but one of the authors who signed on to the published article died before the study began. So I'm always wondering, how do you author a study <laughs> that started after you died? But anyway, yet according to a British medical journal blog, and I took this off the blog, it was funny, that hasn't stopped the dead guy from being an author on a recently published letter that he couldn't have read in response to another letter that he couldn't have read because he was dead about a paper that he couldn't have read because he was dead before he authored it. Okay, so apparently dying doesn't prevent a person from authoring papers and subsequently commenting on them. It's unbelievable, right? Another author of the study that Wilmshurst refused to sign on to, Andrew Dowson, was disciplined by a judge in the UK who upheld a finding of dishonesty by the Medical Practitioners Tribunal Service. He failed to disclose to the Ethics Committee that approved the trial that he had previously been removed from a trial because he had falsified patient data. So he just didn't tell them and he ended up doing the same thing here. Um, he also didn't disclose to the committee that he was being paid $200 an hour by NMT. Why, so he was on the payroll for the company whose product he was investigating at the same time. So at the very least that should have probably been disclosed, right? Wilmshurst reported that his issues with the trial weren't limited to just those pertaining to the disciplined and dead authors. Early in the trial, he became concerned about the data because NMT was involved in writing up the results and made significant changes to how the data were reported. The company refused to disclose all of the data, and Wilmshurst said there were glaring and obvious mathematical errors. The paper reporting the results did say that there wasn't any significant effect on the incidence of migraine, the primary endpoint, but it didn't disclose the side, uh, but it did not include disclosure of the side effects with the device, which included that the device could come loose and cause life-threatening complications. NMT sued Wilmshurst for libel in the UK, and all he did was tell the journalists what was really going on. So they sued him for libel. And they picked the jurisdiction de um, deliberately because, even though it was a US-based company, because in the UK, um, it's incumbent upon the defendant to prove innocence. By choosing its jurisdiction wisely, NMT was more likely to win because the financial burden on Wilmshurst would be uh, most likely cause him to cave. 
well, they miscalculated this big time. Wilmshurst had to pay his own legal fees, and he almost went bankrupt and almost lost his house. He spent every spare moment for three years defending himself, and at the end he won. NMT went bankrupt, and Wilmshurst recovered his investment of tens of thousands of dollars, which he spent on his legal defense. Circulation subsequently published a correction to the original article, which the one that Wilmshurst had re refused to co-author, and it corrected some of, but not all of the errors in the trial. This is not the only time that Wilmshurst stood up to the drug companies. In the early 1980s, he was working at St. Thomas Hospital in London, conducting research on a drug called Amrinone, a heart failure drug made by Sterling Winthrop. The drug was supposed to improve cardiac health, but instead it caused serious side effects and significantly increased the risk of death. According to Wilmshurst, the only evidence in favor of the drug was a single paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The study included eight subjects and the conclusions were not supported by the data. While all five researchers were graduates of Harvard Medical School, I guess that's supposed to be a wonderful thing, two were employees of Sterling at the time, and those conflicts were not reported. The disclosure wasn't required at that time, but the bottom line is that two of the people who did the study on eight patients, only eight on this drug, um, had ties to the drug maker. Sterling threatened legal action if Wilmshurst and his boss published their data and instead asked him to omit data from some of the patients. Doing so would have resulted in an analysis showing that the drug was beneficial. According to Sterling and what they told uh, Wilmshurst and his uh, boss, um, other labs were getting very different results from their research studies and St. Thomas Lab would be completely discredited if they published something different. Uh, Wilmshurst was actually offered two years of salary up front by the drug company in order to stay quiet about the data and not publish. Well, he and his colleague published anyway. Subsequently, three other research groups came forward and reported that they were also threatened in the same way by Sterling. Eventually, Wilmshurst was contacted by a representative of the committee that regulated drugs in the Netherlands at the time. This was before the EU. This person reported that Sterling had cited Wilmshurst research in its application for a product license for Amronin, but that the side effects reported from Wilmshurst were not included in the application. So they, again, it was fraud. In other words, the forms had been falsified. The committee refused to approve the drug and convinced other European countries not to approve it either. Sterling eventually notified the FDA that it was withdrawing the drug in the United States, but Wilmshurst discovered that the drug was still being sold in Africa. By this time, he had firm data showing that the drug increased mortality rates for cardiac patients by as much as 30%. Mortality rates increased by 30%. So he arranged for an organization to purchase the drug in developing countries, submitted proof of purchase to the World Health Organization, and the World Health Organization subsequently forced the company to withdraw the drug worldwide. I guess what struck me about Dr. Wilmshurst's lecture is he retains a great sense of humor while telling these stories. He actually managed to make all of us laugh. In private conversations with him, he seems like a happy guy in spite of all of this. When asked if he thinks things are getting better, he replied that he didn't think so. He also says his experiences are not unusual. He's just one of the rare people who chose to go public with his findings while others choose to remain silent. He says his colleagues have told him that they have also encountered examples similar to um, in an episode similar to the ones that I describe here, but nothing is done about it and academic misconduct is actually quite common. This is apparent when considering how many drugs are marketed as breakthroughs only to find out later on that they're harmful and sometimes completely useless. Wilmser states that this will only change when there's more of a will to do something about it and to change the way research is conducted, results are reported, and appropriate checks and balances are put in place. I personally think it's going to change when we start incarcerating the people who do this. And I'm on, I am now, I'm so fired up after Copenhagen. I really want to see criminal penalties for people who do this kind of thing. I think that's the only way to get through to them, actually. And so uh, more news will be coming about that at some point in time. I have a lot of other ideas of things I'd like to do um, to make this situation better. But uh, again, the continuing theme, you start out hearing these stories. Um, and you cannot believe the callous disregard the health profession and um, academic centers and drug companies and the government have for human life. And then you just can't believe how fabulous people like this guy really are. And, and what a great service this guy did at great peril to himself. All right, hit the subscribe button. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I'll be back to you on Tuesday with more news.